Good evening, everyone. Good to see Hey, Luke from New York City. Welcome to you, everyone. Um, tonight, I thought we'd begin with the, the, this beautiful physical prayer um, that we call the sign of the cross. Most of us probably grew up, if you were up in a charismatic evangelical kind of context, you thought that was a Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox thing even though the sign of the cross still remains in those traditions and Anglican, Anglican traditions, it actually is ancient. It shows up something at the very end of the first century, certainly by the middle of the second century, it's in wide usage as kind of a, kind of a gang sign. <laughs> this, we belong to God and it was a sign that we are the baptized. So I asked uh, Father Paul if he has, you know, there's all kinds of meditations that are associated with that physical prayer. So I asked him to go ahead and share with us maybe uh, one of his favorite, and then just we'll do the sign of the cross together. You start in your forehead, move to your heart, usually start to go over to the left if you're in the West, over to the left shoulder, and back over to the right for the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father Paul. Yeah, so uh, as Bishop Ed mentioned, there are several ways of actually praying this prayer, doing this prayer. Um, it was not too long ago that I learned some of the deep symbolism that's involved in this prayer. And so I'll show you real quick. Uh, even when, when we use our hand to make the sign of the cross on our body, uh, in the East, what you'll see is they take these two fingers, your pinky finger and ring finger, and bring them into your palm. And this symbolizes the two natures of Jesus, the incarnation, and that he is fully God and fully human. And then you bring these three fingers together, symbolizing the Trinity, and that God is three in one. And so it's with this symbolism that we actually cross ourselves. The reflection I wanted to share is, is not so much a, a meditation or a reflection, but just a story that I bumped into about a year ago of this priest who was called in to give last rites to this individual that was getting ready to breathe his last. And the priest arrived at his bed and he's basically been laying there for weeks at this point, um, not physically active, he's been nonverbal. And the priest is standing there and he's praying the prayers and going through these last rites. And as he gets to the moment when it's appropriate for one to cross themselves, this feeble, old, um, just stagnant man in his hospital bed brought his hands up and put his fingers on his forehead, put his fingers on his chest and from each shoulder to shoulder. And the person who shared that reflection with me made the comment that the liturgical stores prayers in our bodies. And I love this idea that when we don't know how to pray, when we're stuck at home for days on end and we keep coming back to the same prayers of praying for our healthcare workers and praying for our own health and praying for our kids and praying for our parents, and we get stuck in these cycles of prayer, sometimes you just run out of things to say. But we can always come back to God be over my mind God be over my body, be over the whole breadth of the human experience. And so if uh, making the sign of the cross, praying the sign of the cross is something that is new to you or foreign to you, um, I want to encourage you to just lean into it, try it for a season, and just see how it shapes you and how it forms you. All right, so let's begin. Get ready. Take your fingers. The West kind of does the flat hand. There are different ways to do it, but if you want to do it like he said it, Two natures of Christ, beautiful. Let's open up in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if you're anything like me, when you hear last night, we're supposed to be sequestered till the end of April, which could mean for those of us outside of the coast, sometime in June or July, there's a part of me that just exhales and goes, oh and uh, kind of sad. Um, and I was thinking about, I, I think that that's appropriate. I think that leaning into the fact that this deep inconvenience and deep kind of um, pulling back um, it isn't, as we've talked about, not supposed to be driven out of fear, though lots of people have fear and God can handle fear. So if you're freaking out, 
It's okay. You can freak out. God doesn't hate you. He still loves you. It's just better not to freak out, right? Because you won't be so freaked out if you don't freak out. Um, <laughs> but uh, how do you process this, right? I mean, how do we begin to day in and day out facing it? Some of you, it's, you know, if you're a, a person that lives by yourself, um, this can be really disorienting, just being so isolated because you've been feeling isolated. Some of you, it's being in the same room with those 15 people <laughs> that you are, you have as your family and you're maybe hoping that someone will give you some space, right? So whatever it is you're processing, some of you that have been very, very busy, maybe you're looking at this as an opportunity to read some that you haven't been able to do and and there's a bit of an upside of, of uh, quietness that, of, that quietness affords us. But um, w whatever you're going through, I, I think one of the things that I would encourage you to do is find, and I'm trying to do, is find the rituals. And that's exactly what Father Paul is just saying. There's, there's a way in which rituals that are more than um, what we say, sometimes it's a touch, um, a look at somebody's face, uh, um, you know, in some way, a smile, right? These are all rituals that we do to sort of help try to express our heart. I think that other kinds of rituals in the context of our faith, one of them is like praying uh, out of a prayer book, like a breviary, they call them, like the Book of Common Prayer. We use this one often uh, in our uh, in the order of St. Anthony's prayer book. Uh, we use a Book of Common Prayer. This is the 2019 version but there is the 1979 version is very popular. You can get them online. You can get them, you can get them, read them online apps that have that, but doing something that has a degree of predictability into it has a surprising way of tethering you. Um, I, another thing one family was telling me about this last week was each morning and each night, cause they're jammed together so much. Uh, they've been talking about what they have found nice and what they have found annoying. And just that little ritual of just opening up about how the day is gone and how it is going is helping to tether them. I think um, what we want, this is not a season to fight each other. This is a season to try to love each other. And I love the text in 1 Corinthians 13 that describes this. Paul is juxtaposing people that have knowledge and think they know everything or they have great power or whatever. And he basically says, you're really nothing. You're like a gong unless you learn how to connect, how to love people. And, and then he describes that famous text in 1 Corinthians, love is patient and love is kind. It's not envy. It doesn't boast. It isn't proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. There's a, a wonderful text in Romans 5 that says, this love that I just read about, that Paul describes, is poured out in our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you think back to the times when you've ever felt closest to God, you will recognize that there's ways in which, actually, uh, John writes this. He says, the first thing evidence uh, the first evidence we have that we have connected with God or that we know God is that we love people. Um, and I think what happens is that love is in our hearts, but then we quash it because of our knowledge or we quash it because we feel like power is being taken from us. And this is just a time, I think, for the church to be loved and to and, and just pray a prayer. Uh, and I've prayed this for years saying, God, love is patient. And because you're in me, I am patient, you know. I am kind. I am. I'm, I don't boast. I don't envy. I'm not proud. You know, I'll say these things, and I'm thinking to myself, "You're lying." <laughs> but there's something about praying into the prayer and opening your heart that I think opens up our our consciousness to the light that is within, instead of this kind of dominating thought, protecting thing that happens in our heads. So I think I think on some level. Um, it's important for us to, to embrace the rituals that keep us loving, keep us tethered so that we can be open to one another. I also think that this is the season to hear from the musicians and to hear from the poets. Um, you know, a, a lot of times, I mean, I'm really a thinking, I'm, I, I have a degree in philosophy, I'm a history degreed person. I love to think thoughts. I love to hear the 
articulations of people, and I'm very much oriented to words. But you know, in things like we're walking through words, they lose some of their punch, it's just words. And so I've been listening, I don't know if you've been watching musicians that are going online and streaming and uh, doing that, uh, just stopping and listening. Uh, the other night, uh, Father JP and Diana are on here, Reverend Diana are on here. Um, hey guys, Ohio. Um, he was doing a musical thing uh, just on the piano and it was, I'm just sitting there uh, crying and it was just ministry. I don't know why, I just, you know, it just, it was wordless and yet powerful. Something I think there's a prophetic a nature to um, our hearts that are so much more important in times of trouble. So seek that out. I actually, um, uh, I wanted to show Reverend Dad, I hope you don't, you don't mind this. I was listening um, to a piece that, that uh, the two of them did uh, on there. They do a podcast called Casa. And, um, and maybe you, if you don't mind, you guys, if you to share that on the, um, the link to that on, on the uh, um, chat. I bet you people would love to see it. But um, Reverend Diana took, who's a, who's a priest, she's an Anglican priest, she took um, what, what Reverend Janice was talking about the other night. Remember what she was talking about? Not isolating and reaching out and, and she made the comment, you know, we shouldn't just text uh, an email, but actually a voice call, maybe FaceTime call. And, and it was just a statement, a couple of statements she made. And then these guys took that statement, this kind of uh, idea, um, concept, that just came out of a face in words and put it into a little more of a storied fashion. So I'm gonna see, I hope I can share this. I'm not used to doing this kind of thing, but let me let me see if I can share this. Hold on one second. I'm gonna share my screen first and see if I can pop this up. I hope you can hear it. Hold on a second. So if I do this, can you all see that? Can see if you can hear it. It's March 28, 2020. It's been raining here in Ohio, and we're starting to lose track of what day it is. We've been at home now for over two weeks, and it's pretty strange. It's new for all of us, but we're going to be okay, and there is hope. It won't last forever. And it will come to an end. Can you hear it? In the meantime, we put the sick. Yeah. And we thank God for everyone who's helping. I heard some really good advice this week that we shouldn't be consumed by what's happening, but we should be informed without being overwhelmed. We should wake up, we should take showers, we should keep living. And most of all, try to find the joy in the surprising places in this time. If you're feeling isolated, maybe pick up the phone and call a friend or family member and text and emails don't count. We may be physically distanced, but we are not separated from each other's hearts and our smiles, and most of all, from the love that we share. More than anything, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God is good, and we are loved. Were you able to hear that? Yeah. So you see my point. It's this, there's something about images. There's something about music. There's something about spinning it out in a storied way that is so tethering. And so let me encourage you. <laughs> to find stuff out there and to find the stuff that helps your soul because this isn't just about you figuring out why this is happening and what's next and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those are valid questions and you should be informed and you should watch for things that are helpful in terms of your mind and what you can do that helps you feel more confident in terms of your discipline uh, in staying with your hands washed and all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, we need the prophetic, we need the, the poets, we need the musicians in times like this. And thank you, um, uh, 
those of you that are doing that kind of thing, those of you that are musicians, uh, Father JP, Reverend J Diana, thank you so much. I read Psalm 33 this morning and it provoked me towards these thoughts that I'm sharing with you. And the text goes, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. It is good for the just to sing praises. Praise the Lord with the harp. Play to him upon the psaltery and the lyre. Sing for him a new song. Send a fanfare with all your skill upon the trumpet. So what's he saying? We need to worship. We need to sing or be sung to. Um, one of the listed fruit of the spirit is joy. And joy shouldn't be confused with happiness. Happiness is an emotion that's connected to circumstances or what haps to us, right? That's where the word comes from. But joy is, is something deeper. It's not necessarily all smiley. Um, it's a sense of expectation of good uh, in the midst of whatever's going on, that God's at work in our hearts and in our lives. Nehemiah claims that the joy of the Lord is the thing that gives us fortitude or strength. So it's really important to find joy, even in the worst of situations, even the most disorienting kind of context. Uh, there's a number of letters that have been discovered that were written by martyrs during the first few centuries of the church that show great courage and perseverance and even joy as they face death. I've got a quote here. One saint wrote while facing imminent death, going to be thrown into the lions. This person wrote, quote, in a dark hole, I have found cheerfulness. In a place of bitterness and death, I have found rest. While others weep, I have found laughter. Where others fear, I have found strength. Who would believe that in a state of misery, I have had great pleasure? That in a lonely corner, I have had glorious company and in the hardest of bonds, perfect repose. All these things Jesus has granted me. He is with me, comforts me, and fills me with joy. He drives bitterness from me and fills me with strength and consolation." End quote. What a treasure that is. The psalm goes on, let all the earth fear the Lord. We'll come back to that in a second. Let all who dwell in the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it came to pass. He commanded and it stood fast. Happy, he goes on, is the nation whose God is the Lord. Happy, the people who have chosen, he has chosen to be his own. The Lord looks down from heaven and beholds all the people of the world. He fashions all the hearts of them. He understands all their works. And then this is a good part. That's all good, I guess. There is no king that can be saved by a mighty army. A strong man is not delivered by his great strength. The horse is a vain hope for deliverance for all its strength it cannot save. What I love about this is that even though we're not supposed to trust in our armies, we're still supposed to have them. Even though the strong man is not supposed to think his great strength can deliver him, he's still supposed to be strong and grow in strength. Even though a horse might be a vain hope for victory and deliverance, God still had them have horses. In other words, there's something in the tradition that demands we do our best. You know, we wash our hands, we don't touch our face, we do what we need to do, we're vigilant, we, we're, we're social distancing, but we don't trust it. We, we do it, we're vigilant with it, but we don't trust it. We're ultimately trusting in God as we do what we know to do. We can't not do that because we trust God. You're, I'm sure you've seen news reports about churches that are still getting together because they have victory over the virus. Uh, they, I just read a report that just came out today on Reuters that talked about they have traced back one of the major outbreaks from, um, that happened in Paris from a Christian gathering of thousands that had gotten together uh, where some people in that had COVID and it sort of blossomed out from there. This is not smart to just violate common sense, right? This is not smart. God doesn't bless that. During the plagues that came through Europe, a lot everybody thought the religious people would be protected. And a lot of times the whole of the monastery, everyone died. It, it, this is, it's, you have to do what you can do. And yet, even though we do, we can't trust it. We've got to trust in God. And so it's one thing either people think, I'm just going to trust the Lord and be an idiot, or some people say, I'm going to not, I'm going to do everything right and realize 
you can't trust that. We still have to ultimately trust God and hope that, and our, our hope and our, and our fear is in the Lord. And then he goes on, I got to finish this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him, on those who wait for his love. Fearing God is not like being scared to death of him. I think fearing God is just simply, you know how you fear people? When you walk into a room and you're kind of freaked out that the, that person's there or those people are there. And what, what fear is, you start looking at yourself, not through your own eyes, but through that person's eyes. It's funny, as a pastor, when I've done weddings, the men, you know, because they're not carrying flowers and stuff, you know, the men, when, we, we ha- when I have them stand in front of everyone in a wedding, they go, what do I do with these? You know, <laughs> I don't know what to do with these huge things they have on their bodies. And, and they feel worried because they're trying to figure out what to do with their hands. Why are they thinking that? Because they're seeing themselves through the eyes of the congregation and it's freaking them out, right? They want to know that they look perfect. Fearing the Lord is not so much being afraid of him as much as recognizing that when you're living and when you're acting, you're doing it before him. And that you start seeing yourself through his eyes, which is kind of beautiful because he loves you. And so when you're washing your hands or when you're socially distancing or when you're you know, not touching your face, it's not just something we do to ourselves. We do it as unto the Lord to, to love people and to do what we know to do as a trust to him. Our soul, the text goes on, waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Indeed, our heart rejoices in him. For in his holy name, we put our trust. And then it ends by saying, let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us as we have put our trust in you. So I thought, let's just run around the, the screen here. <laughs> and maybe a, a couple of you could, or three or four of you can talk about how you're staying tethered to trust during this season. I mean, is music helping you? Maybe you're out, you know, roaming around with social distancing and creation. Um, you know, are, are these meetings on the eights helping you? I mean, how are you staying connected with others, finding solace, right, in your life without being lonely? So let's hear from a few of you. Just unmute yourself. You can either push the space button on your computer and that automatically unmutes you and then you pull off and mute you again. Or you can just, you'll have to do it on your phone or whatever. But just let's have two or three or four of you do it. What are you doing? I'm unmuted, okay. Do I need to raise my hand? No, no, Mary, we hear you, go. So, um, you know, I think that attending these, the eights whenever I can helps. I think, um, you know, reaching out to my friends and, you know, talking to them, chatting with them on the phone, you know, my, yeah, I, I chat with my daughter briefly to a little bit longer every day. Um, but it's, it's still hard, you know, it's, yeah. it's not easy. However, I do not think for one moment there's an alternative. You know, I know that this is what I need to do and I need the grace of God to help me to do that. Um, but, you know, a lot of things Janice said were, you know, I, they were just spot on. Um, you know, I kind of, some of the things she said, you know, those are things I've said to my clients before, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, you know, but it's not unusual for me to have to tell myself the same thing I might have told a client <laughs> because I'm human too. And just because I'm in a particular role doesn't, you know, I have not arrived <laughs> And that's, I think, the same thing in, in Christianity. You know, yeah. there, there is no arrival. It is, you know, we, we press toward the mark and we do that on a daily basis. And You're also dealing with some physical, you know, you're getting healed up. That adds on to the deal. Yeah. But thank you for being on here. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's beautiful. Someone else? I uh, started taking classes with a couple of my friends. So we all signed up for the same online classes and started watching them so that we could 
call and discuss it with each other after. Oh, that's nice. And that's dude. been a good yeah. way to, to connect yeah. for us. Very good. This is a time to do something like that you haven't been able to do. That's actually smart. Someone else. Uh, this is Elsa. Um, I do a few things uh, that I like the tethering. I, I'm in a Bible plan with my, uh, uh, three of my sisters through oh, the wow. Bible app. And uh, oh, so they usually run about a week. We've been doing it before this started. And this, this every morning we all read it and then we, we talk it over on the plan. And then of course we talk to each other a lot. But I think also the routines, because I uh, used to go to the gym all the time. So I have equipment here. I make sure sometime, usually after work, because I work from home, that I keep that routine up. In fact, just before I got on here, I was on the elliptical and doing weights. Don't, don't make us feel bad. Just share, Elsa. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, and then, you know, just keeping that same routine up, I think, um, and then uh, I agree, listening to music has been very, very helpful. So just making sure I do, a, I have a lot of different things that I, I, I live alone. So I understand Mary and the isolation. It truly is. I do have one quick thing. Um, not, not, we don't know anything yet about my granddaughter. She has a spinal tap on April 14th, but um, she is doing much better. Oh, that is awesome news. Thank you for sharing that much better her symptoms are almost gone so it's wonderful thank you for praying beautiful we'll praise the lord for that missy you had something yeah um i feel like my experience has been kind of a little opposite um like being alone and isolating has never really been a problem for me because i feel like i tend to isolate easily um but for me this time has really kind of shined a light on how important it is to be around people. Like it's kind of bringing an awareness to me of how much I need to be around people. Um, so I just feel like God is kind of revealing himself in that because, because I am such an independent person, um, I just feel like he's, he's revealing himself how I, I need to be more dependent on people and actually reach out and connect to them and, and make an effort. So I just- That's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Let's do two more quick. So um, we uh, actually decided to uh, take a little staycation, I guess. We went to Keystone Lake with our uh, golden retriever, Abby. Abby. She swam yeah. a lot. <laughs> and uh, there, was a, there were no people near there, us. There were no people near us. We, were, we went to a marina. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Not we were – well, we didn't go to a marina, but like, we were um, relatively close to a, um, a boat ramp. But uh, yeah, we just kind of threw rocks for our dog. She loves to swim, and so we just hung out there and we just enjoyed nature. And it was, uh, yeah. it was so we were more than thirty feet away from the closest person. Very far away. So we were definitely practicing the social distancing. But it was just nice to get out in nature and really enjoy the nice weather. Yeah. It was, it felt so good. We really that is, it. that is so wonderful. Thanks for you know, so many people, Father Preston. You could probably speak to this, but just everybody's personality has a kind of lean to to a spiritual kind of encounter. And for a lot of people, it really is nature. I, I, I don't, I have to force myself to be uh, in the nature world because I'm so in my head, I forget that I'm outside. But, but there are some people, you want to say anything about that, Father Preston? No, you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more, who do we got? I do think it's a funny time we're living in when we're applauding how far away somebody stayed from another human being. <laughs> like 30 feet. That's incredible. And we're applauding you. Yes. Well done. Well done. Um, yeah, being able to, you know, this is, it's a bit of a privileged position, I guess, because being able to work from home, um, being able to go out and go for walks with my kids and with my dog, my wife. Um, this, I mean, we're still in the season of Lent, right? And 
So it's easy for, for me to forget what are the initial things that I gave up for Lent, but so much of the, my practices through the season were really to orient me to silence and to getting still and sh starting to shut out noise. And it feels like in a lot of ways that that was forced upon me here in the last couple of weeks. Um, but really seeing those things as a gift and as a grace. And, um, you know, we sat at our, din our, our dining room table tonight and opened the windows and listened to the rain. And um, I think just coming back the, to the, the idea that these moments are in some ways a gift because we're living them and because we're living them, Christ is with us. And so just being sure to lean into whatever our experience is in the moment. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, we've been joking about the fact that this is uh, enough Lent just by virtue of this virus that we might cancel it next year because we, we put in at least two good years of Lent in one year. Hey, Reverend Diana, would you uh, uh, pray us out? Let's go ahead and close in prayer. I'm going to leave the chat room open uh, after we kind of finish this in case anyone wants to keep chattering. You certainly can. I've been uh, ending it, but um, there's about 30 of us on here and we're not all have a chance to share, but if you want to, if you see somebody on here, you want to shout out to or whatever. Um, some people are hiding like Travis. He's hiding. We're not even really sure he's there. Jim Beecham, we're, I'm, I'm calling you out, brother. I know you're there somewhere in the spirit world, but I just see your name. But, um, but would you go ahead, uh, Ramadana, and just lead us out in the Lord's Prayer. Let's all pray it together. Let us pray. Our Father, Father who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.